Good morning. I'm Katie Merrill, and um, I'm the moderator of this morning for the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago's Sunday platform. Um, we are continuing to use a hybrid approach to our platforms with a small audience here in person, yay, um, and a virtual audience through our YouTube channel. Um, we'll, uh, the way this will work out, I will um, introduce our speaker, he'll give his talk, and then afterwards we'll have a Q&A. If you're online, you'll be able to introduce, uh, to enter your questions um, through the YouTube chat. And if you're here in the room, you can come up to this microphone over there and ask your question with your own voice. Um, so we usually introduce and start with a, some kind of a reading about humanism and um, or our beliefs or something about our community. And weirdly enough, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with that last night, somehow I landed on Linus Pauling, who is the only person who has received both a scientific Nobel Prize and the Nobel Peace Prize for his humanitarian work. And um, turns out he was an interesting, smart man. Who knew? Um, but a quote I found from him that I'm going to use to speak for what we, what I think we're about and why we're here is a pretty short quote, and I like it a lot. Humanism is a philosophy of joyous service for the greater good of all humanity, of application of new ideas, of scientific progress for the benefit of all. So yay to Linus Pauling, and um, I'm just going to let that be our introduction today. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, we are a self-governing, small-D democratic community with a building here in Skokie, Illinois, um, and now with a reach through the magic of the internet. Our programs address a wide variety of topics, including current events, philosophy, arts, and sciences, to name just a few. Today's presentation is part of our ongoing programming relating to the humanities. We're gonna hear from Carrie Cranston, talk about the American Writers Museum, Many Voices, One Vision. Um, Carrie has been president of the American Writers Museum since 2016. He was previously president of Fox College, a private career college in Chicago, and held leadership positions at PR firms Hill and Knowlton and Kemper Lesnick. Carrie has taught writing at the University of Illinois at Chicago and at DePaul University. He serves on the board of Fox College. Carrie holds a BA in English from DePaul, an MA in English from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and an MS in Library and Information Sciences from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Uh, welcome me, help me welcome Carrie, thanks. Hi everybody, um, hi to everybody in the room, hi to everybody who's online. Um, this is uh, my first time doing a hybrid uh, talk with anyone. Uh, I, I actually talked to a large audience recently. We had our, our annual fundraiser and we had it in person with COVID protocols and people spread out and all kinds of stuff, but um, it was interesting. Uh, but this is interesting too, and I'm, I'm glad I got a chance to talk to all of you. Um, and I'll try and remember to look at you in the camera every now and again. Um, so. Uh, Basic introductions in hand, I'm the president of the American Writers Museum. The museum opened in 2017. Uh, I thought maybe I would show you a short two minute video that kind of gives an overview with some visuals that make it a little easier than me just showing a PowerPoint. Um, so I'm just gonna hit play on this video really quickly. In May of 2017, the American Writers Museum opened to the public. The museum is a space of infinite wonder that celebrates the writers of the past, promotes the writers of the present, and inspires the writers of the future. During our first three years, over 100,000 visitors came through our doors, including over 20,000 students. Most of those students engaged with our exhibits and special curriculum materials at no cost to them, thanks to the support of our generous donors. Our programming brought in authors from around the country to speak with diverse audiences and promote the importance of writing. 2020 brought challenges, but also opportunities. While visitors could not visit in person, we brought the museum to them in their homes. We took our huge collection of digital content, curated by a team of nearly 50 scholars and writers from around the country, and created online exhibits like My America, Frederick Douglass, Agitator, and American Voices. Then we launched new online exhibits on Hisaya Yamamoto and Ray Bradbury, with more to come. We hosted 31 live online programs with authors, 
rolled out a live online virtual field trip program reaching students from Connecticut to California and launched a national writing contest with submissions from across the country. Our YouTube channel features past and present content, as well as three new podcasts. Through our online channels, we served hundreds of thousands of new visitors and students across the country in 2020. Now we are open again. Visitors and students are back, and soon live author programs will return, but now we can stream them live around the world. We are excited by the avenues that have opened to us, and as the country slowly returns, we are hopeful as ever about the American Writers Museum, an amazing place to visit, both in person and online. So, um, I hope that gives you a bit of an overview of what the American Writers Museum is. Um, what I was gonna do today was talk a little bit about the history of the development of the institution and uh, what goes into that process. And as an organization that deals in ethical humanism, I thought we would wanna discuss somewhat the nature of some of the decision processes that went into who's featured in the museum, why they're featured in the museum, how we develop exhibits, and what goes into some of that process and some of the discussions that occur around it. So um, that being said, uh, my PowerPoint is mostly just pictures um, because our space is a very interactive and engaging space. Um, the conceptualization of an American Writers Museum came about because of primarily one individual. Now, he will argue that it was a team effort and there were lots of people involved, but a man named Malcolm O'Hagan, who's an Irish immigrant. Um, Malcolm uh, had no background in museums, no background in um, uh, literature beyond a love of poetry and, and writing in general. So uh, Malcolm was an engineer had a long career, ran the National Electrical Manufacturers Association out of Washington, DC, and retired. And in his retirement, decided to um, you know, do something fun. And he was a docent at the Library of Congress giving tours, talking about writing, talking about literature, and he really enjoyed it. He went home to visit family in Ireland one, one year and was visiting the Irish Writers Museum in Dublin and discovered that there was no such thing as an American Writers Museum. He came back to the US, he's like, where's the American Writers Museum? Didn't exist. So he thought there should be one. So he just started talking to people. He's Irish, so he was pretty good at that. Um, so he, he, he went out, he started talking to people and people got excited about the idea. And he used that um, excitement to gather together a group of voices to help determine what would an American Writers Museum be? Um, what should be in an American Writers Museum? Where should it be? These were some of the big questions that had to be answered. And so early on in the process, um, you know, the museum developed a mission. You know, what, what is it about? Um, you know, and it's basically to explore the influence um, of writers in our history, our identity, our culture, our daily lives. You know, one of the things that Malcolm would talk about sometimes um, and still would bring up is the notion that, you know, we have Hall of Fames for sports figures. We have, you know, amazing things that celebrate movie stars and other people in our culture. Why in an American culture are we not celebrating writing? Um, and, and why, you know, if we're not, you know, why not? You know, what, what's what's wrong with us if we're not doing that? And how do we get people excited about it? Because it's so instrumental to who we are. Um, and I, I bring up an example that, that comes up all the time because people say, well, is a library a writer's museum? And, and the answer is, well, no, a library is a repository of knowledge and, and a wonderful institution. I have a degree in library science. Um, I think libraries are great, uh, but it's not a museum, it's not a place to engage necessarily um, in conversation. They may have spaces within libraries for some of that. Some libraries will even have exhibit space. Um, if you haven't visited you know, the Newberry Library here in Chicago, um, I encourage you to visit the Newberry Library and encourage you to check out some of the exhibits that they put together and amazing programming. Um, Chicago Public Library, obviously, um, and many public library systems do great programming and other things that museums do as well. But it's still a conversation, a museum is often a conversation about our past with our present. 
Um, and so a lot of times the way we talk about our museum is that the content of our museum celebrates the writers of the past. Um, but at the same time, we have programming to promote the writers of the present. And that being said, all of those things are really meant to bring together points of inspiration for writers of tomorrow. Um, and so that's really what we're about as an institution. And, um, but sometimes people say, well, you know, what's in your museum? And you can see from some of these pictures, you're not seeing tons of books. You're not seeing, um, there is a wonderful thing called the book cloud as you walk in. If you look up above your head, there are books. Obviously you can't reach them or hanging from the ceiling um, and suspended above you. There are places in the museum where you can pick up a book and look through it, but they're carefully selected um, and tied to different things going on in the museum. But much of the museum are touch screens, interactive tools, um, places for people to write like typewriters. Um, this is uh, something that people get super excited about, kids especially, um, people who have never touched them before. So these typewriters are there, people write on them, they post their stories on the wall, they take them home with them. A couple of people have had um, marriage proposals on these typewriters. Um, so we, we have a lot of fun with the typewriters. Uh, it, it takes up a huge amount of time for one of my staff members. What we thought would be something cute that would be out there and people would touch every now and again is actually something people go nuts over. So we have to repair typewriters. We've become very good at repairing typewriters, gaining typewriters. People have donated them. Um, so it's, it, but it, it's, a, it's that analog point of con, you know, connection to writing and to how people wrote in the past that gets people excited. Um, as, as we might say sometimes, uh, the typewriter, especially the manual typewriter, um, is really that piece of technology that was made solely for the purpose of writing. I mean, we can all pick up pencil and pen and write or pencil and paper, and um, but you, know, you could also doodle and draw and make a list to go to the grocery store and, and other things. Um, if you pick up a computer, we all know we have a lot of distractions that, that can take us away from the writing. Um, but a typewriter pretty much sets you down to the notion of, well, I'm here to write something. Um, but so that, that's what our museum is about. So people will often say, well, then, you know, what about the artifacts? What about the things? Um, and we are not an artifact based museum. Uh, we are an interactive and engaging museum. We will have artifacts from time to time in special exhibits. So we have two changing galleries and we will often have borrowed pieces that will be, you know, center point to some of those exhibits. And the reasoning here is that we, um, as a museum, we're meant to celebrate writers and their works. And then people would say, well, what about the physical books? And, and that's great. But I give the example, and this goes to the notion of an American Writers Museum and the importance of writing in American history and culture, is um, the Declaration of Independence is a really good example of something we think about as an artifact, right? There's a whole movie about sealing it, and there's secret stuff on the back of it, and it's you know this amazing document, and somehow the document, the physical manifestation of the document is magical. Um, and what's, what's funny about that is the notion that you know, what happened to the Declaration of Independence on the day it was finished, when the first signatures were set to it. Um, and, and yes, I know not all the signatures went on the first day and there were multiple days and all of that. But that night after the initial set of signatures were put on it, where did it go? You know, it didn't go to a museum. It didn't go to a library. It went to the printers. It was immediately typeset because it needed to be distributed. The physical document was not important. The words were important. The preservation of the words, the movement of the words into from one medium to another, the distribution of the words um, and where they were sent. They were sent to all of the newspapers in the colonies. They were sent to the soldiers that were out um, and, and defending different areas and already in skirmish with the English. Um, so the words themselves were what were important, not that physical manifestation of a document that we've given you know, a huge amount of weight to as a piece of paper. Um, but the words were what were important. So, so that's why as a museum, we think that the interactions and the interactives that people have are what's really important. It's also important to engage people in ways that are tactile, in ways that include things like, um, you see a bunch of boxes in the lower right of this picture and it's called the surprise bookshelf. And you open these doors and there's information about different works. 
And um, what's fun about it is, you know, there are things you don't know and you learn something new. A lot of them just have text and pictures when you open them. Some of them have videos, some of them have audio, um, but there are actually five of them in there that have smells. Um, why? Because smell is important. And it's a, it's a sense and it's something that ties us to um, the metaphor or to the language that's being used. So we believe in the importance of these types of interactions. Now, as I was saying, I was talking about the history of the development of the museum. And um, so Malcolm O'Hagan had come up with this idea and he began talking to people. And in these initial talks, um, he was able to gather up different experts, different people who had ideas about museums. And then um, with some help, as he put a team together of people who were interested, uh, they were able to get some consultation from the Smithsonian's. And they sat down with them and they said, you know, uh, what do we want to do? This is what we're thinking about. What do you think we should do? And the folks at the Smithsonian um, were very specific. And they said, you know, we're going to give you two things. Wait, I, I believe I may be the vice president. There's a fly that just landed on my hair. Um, the, uh, the, the previous vice president. Um, so um, anyway, the, uh, uh, you know, the Smithsonian said two things. Well, one they said was, you need a really good design firm because you're gonna to need to bring this to life. And as you can see from some of the pictures, it's a very visual space. And um, they encouraged us to work with a design firm out of Boston called Amaze Design, um, who actually had done a lot of science museums. And so when you think about what type of museum is the American Writers Museum, we're a lot like a science museum. Um, you know, you might say, well, aren't you a history museum? Well, most history museums have lots of pieces and artifacts. And since we don't, we're a lot more engaging like a science museum might be trying to challenge your thoughts and ideas. The, um, but the other thing they said was don't have a single curator. If you have a single curator, you will have a singular voice. And the story of American writing is obviously not a singular voice. And so that is what led to the development of what was called the content leadership team. Um, so I'm just showing you some pictures of people in the space, students having a good time. Um, I'm just going to jump to the idea of our content leadership team. And this was a group of folks who were really focused on helping develop the content. And they were a, a broad ranging group. Um, uh, Reg Gibbons is a professor from Northwestern and a poet and a publisher. Um, and uh, Maria Rana uh, is a major factor at the Library of Congress, uh, was the former Washington Post's literary critic um, and a novelist and an essayist and a, a writer of nonfiction herself. Um, Leonard Marcus is an author and a critic of children's books. Um, Donna Seaman is the book list editor at American Library Association, uh, former poet laureate at Natasha Trethewey. So it was a, a group of people who were helping to shape the ideas of what writers should be involved, um, should be featured, who should we talk about. Um, they also went around the country and held um, charrettes, which were workshops to try and get people together and say, hey, what should be in a writer's museum? So they, they had charrettes in New York, they had charrettes in Chicago, they had them in, um, I believe they may have had some in Colorado and California. Um, and in each city, they would go and invite academics, writers, different people who would say, this is my thoughts of what should be in there and who should be covered. And then this group of content leadership team helped in the recruitment of uh, subject matter experts. So if you're in the museum, there's a wall that actually lists over 40 other subject matter experts who were involved in discussions that went into the putting together of the museum or who maybe supplied content on particular writers or genres or periods. So it is definitely a museum that was curated by large groups of people. Um, to make it engaging, to make it interesting, and to hear those different voices and who should be brought into the conversation. And, um, and that's what makes it fun. And, but, you know, I can't say that it went uh, perfectly smoothly, as you might imagine, with a group of people, many of whom have strong opinions. There may have been arguments and disagreements about how certain things were handled, which writers should be talked about. So a lot of times when people will come into the museum, the first thing they'll notice is this giant timeline um, that runs down the one hall. Um, you see the woman standing there in front of the timeline and there's a hundred authors featured there. So there's an instant assumption that, well, those hundred authors must be the top 100. And, and we are careful to say never is that the case. These are a hundred authors who are emblematic and representative of periods. 
Um, so they give us a representation of that period and they were chosen for that reason. Um, they may have been chosen because some of their works, even if they were far in the past, are still very relevant today. And then of course, somebody will get to the end of the timeline and be like, well, why does it stop here? Um, and the answer is that within things we consider um, permanent within the museum, like that timeline or the surprise bookshelf, uh, the authors featured are all deceased. Um, and that was a deciding note of the um, content leadership team. They said, you know what, in the exhibits that are permanent, let us focus on the past because that's what museums do. And as I said, we talk to the present mostly through our programming and sometimes through our temporary exhibits, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the, um, but the, the general notion was, so, you know, how do we, why do we cut them off? And, and, you know, there's another notion, as I said, there were a lot of people involved in this museum. No one wanted to say to um, someone they may know, like Stephen King, you know, well, you're not in it. Um, this way you could just say, well, you're not in it because you're still alive. Um, and so, so that was one of the deciding factors. Um, and, and then, you know, the final thing that had to be decided was where do you put a museum like this? As I mentioned, Malcolm O'Hagan was in Washington, D.C. Early on, most of the people involved in this museum were from Washington, D.C. And then from different parts of the country as different folks got involved. Um, but after a few years, they, they had held those charrettes, they had been to other cities, and they started looking at um, making the decision, and they had a series of factors involved with that. And those factors were pretty simple. You know, it was, is it accessible to a lot of people? It's a national museum, so we want it accessible. So therefore, it needed to be in a destination city. Um, is it a, a place um, that has a philanthropic community who will support it? Um, and is it in a space, in a place that has a strong literary tradition of its own? And so Chicago marked all of those things and being central to the country seemed like the place for them. And when they came and they talked to people in the city about it, there was a strong reception. And so they went about trying to get it built here. They were raising the money. They had started working on content. The design team had begun uh, engagement with design. And from there, they had really um, started to put together what this museum would look like and, and how it would engage with people. And so, you know, like I said, at some point in that process, once a space was picked, decisions had to be made. Like this timeline uh, was originally conceived with 300 writers in it. You know, to cover 400 years of history and have 300 writers made a lot of sense. Um, space, fundraising, and other things in reality led to, well, we've got room for 100. Um, so there might have been some heated discussions about whether or not Theodor Dreiser would be on that wall. Um, there, there were decisions that some of us regret at the time because um, it was right before Hamilton opened. And so um, Madison is on the wall, but Hamilton is not. Um, so, you know, there are all kinds of issues as to things that might have gotten missed. Um, but the uh, but in the end, uh, it is still very much an engaging space that lets people um, find out about the past. And as I said, there are other parts of the museum that let people interact with deep works, um, that let people play games with words and with language. Um, we have multiple places within the museum where people can write, leave messages for people, uh, leave their works with us, take their works home with them, however they feel comfortable. Um, but as I mentioned, we have some changing gallery spaces. And this is where I've been more involved. Um, a lot of this happened between 2011 and 2016 when I came on board. A lot of the initial fights had occurred. It was final decisions that I was involved in with the designer, getting things up and running That when we opened in 2017. And, um, but since that time, you know, a couple of things occurred. And one was our programming. Um, so as we opened, we started inviting authors. We invited historians to talk about authors of the past, but we talked with a lot of modern audiences as well. And we put together programming. We also rolled out our educational programming. So we recognized that this space was something that was really engaging for young people and gave us the opportunity to get them excited about the idea of writing. So one of the things we did was we put together curriculum. Um, we took that curriculum and made it at different grade levels so that when teachers came in, they could have their students actually walking around and engaging with the content and having something to look at and questions to answer. 
So that was one of the things that we were focused on. The other was, who are we going to bring in? So, you know, who are modern voices? Who are voices who may not be recognized as well within the content of the museum because their voices were not heard as often in the past? Um, so how do we address some of those issues? And um, so that has led to, um, you know, carefully chosen program speakers um, that bring in different audiences. Uh, it's led to opportunities for students to interact with authors, um, where we've brought in field trips of students with a given author who might be giving a talk that night, but it also does one during the day with students. Um, so in, in these photos, you see, um, sorry, <clears throat> award-winning author Jacqueline Woodson. Um, you actually see um, the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass um, and uh, a, um, a, a wonderful woman um, who has put together uh, the uh, book club that became a national phenomenon, uh, which is called The Well-Read Black Girl. Um, so if you want to check that out online, it's a wonderful resource. Um, these are other speakers that were brought in to talk with students um, and where students were able to get copies of their books. And, you know, this is the type of engagement that we've been focused on. So one of the decisions early on that we made was making education a huge component of what we do, bringing in the staff necessary to do that, um, putting together the curriculum, dedicating the time, and then raising the money so that we can make field trips free for low income students that we could actually pay for buses to make sure that schools from low income areas where they might not have the resources at that school could actually put in a busload of kids, bring them down and have no expense on themselves. Um, so that is one of the things that we've been focused on as an institution. Um, now, as I said, we have two changing spaces. Our museum itself is not huge. It's about 11,000 square feet. It's the second floor of the building that we're in. So it's the entire second floor of uh, 180 North Michigan at Michigan and Lake. So please come visit if you have not. Um, and so there's a small room called the writer's room where we tend to do small exhibits on one author at a time. Um, there is a somewhat larger gallery that we have done multiple exhibits in on different topics. And this is where we've tended to touch on the living. Um, so uh, when we opened, and, and also these are the spaces where we tend to have artifacts. So for example, when we opened, we had the Kerouac scroll. Um, if you're familiar with Jack Kerouac's On the Road, you might know the story that he wanted to write um, uh, without breaks and, and in a stream of consciousness. So he took teletype paper. I'm going to say some of us in the room remember teletype paper. Uh, when I have to explain this to students and younger folks, they don't always know what I'm talking about, but they were long reams of paper that newsrooms had um, <clears throat> and teletype machines spit out the news on, but they were tissue thin. So as an artifact, it's an amazing actual physical writing artifact because he was a fast typist typing in an era on still manual typewriters, but hated having to change every 12 inches a sheet of paper. So if you come to the museum, we do not obviously still have the physical uh, manuscript. There's a picture of it right there. Um, it was in a case. Um, we had an exhibit about the book and about Jack Kerouac. It, the object was on loan to us from a gentleman out of Indiana named Jim Irsay. You may know him as the owner of the Indianapolis Colts. He was also a collector of a number of amazing artifacts, um, including Bob Dylan's uh, guitar the night he went electric. Um, and so uh, he has been nice to loan us some things over time. And, and so the scroll travels around the world. He's very generous about letting people, institutions borrow it and make exhibits about it. Um, but like I said, the paper is now tissue thin, can only be handled by one um, person named Jim Canary, a wonderful guy, uh, has a wonderful Santa Claus beard, is a special collections librarian out of uh, IU, and it flies around the world um, to roll the scroll, transport the scroll, um, unroll it, get it into cases, um, and, and just a, a, a supremely wonderful guy. He has a real job beyond the scroll. Um, <laughs> but uh, a, a wonderful and interesting person that we got to meet because of this special exhibit. Um, and, and for some people, seeing that object is, is hugely um, interesting. We also have an electronic screen of it, so you can scroll through the whole thing. You can see his pencil edits, you can see how he took every 15 feet is how long those sheets were and taped them together. So there's eight pieces to it. You know, it's 120 feet long when it's fully rolled out. 
it's <clears throat> it's an absolutely fascinating notion. Um, so so that was a wonderful artifact that we had in an exhibit that we put together. Um, we did an exhibit, like I said, on Bob Dylan um, and looked at him as a songwriter because as a writer's museum, one of the decisions was, are we only about literature? No, we're about all forms of writing. So, you know, there are people who wrote cookbooks, science writers, all types of writers are featured in our museum in different places and in different ways. Um, and so songwriting is obviously a huge part of American culture and history. And Bob Dylan is one of the most um, well-known songwriters, one of the most covered songwriters, um, and the only one to win a Nobel Prize for literature. So we thought it would be an interesting piece. We had access to some wonderful um, artifacts, uh, both from Mr. Irsay and from other collectors who were nice enough to loan us some of their pieces. And we put together uh, an exhibit that really focused on that notion of the importance of songwriting and one author's works in that area. So um, we had an exhibit on Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, we had some of her original notebooks and some other pieces that put that together. These seem like simple canonical things. We've now taken on, of course, in the same time frame, we, we started looking at some uh, larger scale initiatives and content initiatives. We, oh, we also did have a really cool exhibit of typewriters. Um, as I mentioned, we have typewriters for people to touch. Um, we did have an exhibit, again, a wonderful collector who was nice enough to loan us. Um, he started collecting years ago um, the actual typewriters of famous authors. Um, so Ernest Hemingway, Jack London, um, all types of people, Maya Angelou. Uh, we actually filled it out with some borrows from other places and had an exhibit called Tools of the Trade, which looked at typewriters and other objects. We had Frederick Douglass's uh, pen and inkwell we had Helen Keller's Braille Writer, um, and uh, and it was just a fun piece for people to visit and um, and to get a sense of all of the different ways that these people wrote. Um, we did a special exhibit on Frederick Douglass. Now, when we did each of these, as I mentioned, our philosophy has always been that we do not have an in-house curator. Um, so when I say we, what I'm normally referring to is that initial process that went into creating the museum is then the process that we utilized to um, put together our special exhibits. So with Bob Dylan, we had a, a very well-known um, author on rock and roll history um, who worked with us and, um, and on Chicago history. And, and so we, we were able to work with that person and then with other subject matter experts on Bob Dylan. Um, same thing with um, uh, Frederick Douglass. We had you know, one of the most well-known scholars on Frederick Douglass in, at Harvard um, who was able to consult with us, give us some guidelines, some ideas, and direct us to a, a young um, PhD student at that time um, named Kedrick Roy. Uh, and so Kedrick was someone who was uh, instrumental in helping us put together the rest of the exhibit that we had on Douglas that was focused not on Frederick Douglass as we think of him as the writer of his autobiography and the, um, you know, the work that he did as an abolitionist, but really his work as an abolitionist post the Civil War. So we were looking at his 30 years of writing from the end of the Civil War until his death. <clears throat> and he was a very, very prolific writer and speech writer um, and publisher. And so, you know, the latter years of his life are absolutely fascinating and influential. And so we really wanted to focus on that. And so he was able to pull out speeches, go through materials and really help us put together an exhibit that was very engaging. Um, so that was an early exhibit of ours that we, um, we had put up as one of the temporary exhibits. And so in each of these, we're always bringing in people to dialogue with, people who can tell us stories. Um, then we wanted to do something even larger. So in our changing, big changing space, um, we wanted to address the issue of immigrant and refugee writing in America. But we really wanted this one to focus on modern voices because inevitably, <clears throat> as, as this exhibit points out, Every writer in American literary history or, or American history who is not Native American is an immigrant writer of some generation. They may be first generation, second, third, fourth, fifth, but somewhere in there, they did not come to this, they, they were not of this country originally. 
and, and its peoples. So everybody to some extent falls in that. So that being said, what we really wanted to do was focus on those voices today who are immigrant and refugee writers who either came here themselves as children, as adults, or whose parents came here. Um, and they were born here, but they lived through an immigrant or refugee experience in their lives. <clears throat> so we actually went around the country and interviewed 31 writers of varying scopes, you know, from novelists to graphic novelists to um, uh, filmmakers to uh, sports writers. And we talked to them about 10 different themes and questions. And then we were able to put together a multimedia exhibit where you can walk through and explore each of those themes and hear dozens of different ideas and permutations and thoughts from a broad spectrum of people. And to do this, again, we needed to bring in a team. So some people we knew because they had met with us or done programs with us. Some people we knew because they were recommended. Some have been cornerstones of the museum. So Maria Rana, as I mentioned before, was part of our content leadership team. Um, and uh, Vietan Nguyen um, had visited the museum and was willing to be a senior advisor on the project. Um, Alain Stevans, uh, Vu Tran, I don't have my glasses on and I don't want to, Deepika Mukherjee um, and Layla Halaby um, were the primary advisory team. And um, they were instrumental in helping us discuss what writers should we think about um, and who should we want to interview? What questions should we ask? How do we go about determining these questions? And the, the funny thing about it is that even the name of the exhibit, and this goes to the notion of listening to multiple voices and listening to the voices of those people who are represented in the work and what you're doing. So we thought it was important to do this, as I mentioned, because some voices are not as well represented when we look at our historical works as, um, as other voices are. And so to do that, um, we, we gathered these folks together. They helped us identify lists of writers. But even early on, um, this project was originally called um, Becoming American. Now, that title was chosen because Alain Stevans has a wonderful anthology. He's an editor, a publisher, a poet. Um, he's a wonderful guy. Um, and he, uh, he had that anthology and I asked him, is it okay if we title this after your anthology, Becoming American? And, and the anthology is, you know, covers centuries of American history through writing from immigrants. That's what the anthology is. And, and he said, sure, go right ahead. And we, that was what we were moving forward with. And then one day in one of our conversations with this team, somebody said, well, is that the right title? Like, does everybody become American? Is American a thing? Um, and are we all supposed to just be that and strive to be that and give up who we were? And then we said, oops, okay, maybe that wasn't the right decision for a title. Um, and so we, we struggled. Um, we, we brainstormed and we talked with the group and we ran through and then, you know, it doesn't seem like it's that much of a stretch to go from that to my America, but it is about who's defining what is America and who has voice and who has authority. And so we, we, we thought that that was a really good example of how multiple voices involved in a project are essential to making sure that you put together something that um, really represents the people and the groups that you're talking to. Um, because you never want to be talking for someone. Um, you want to be facilitating their ability to speak. So that was um, one of the early uh, instances of us really working through a big project of content and trying to ascertain, you know, how do we make this work? Um, and, and the exhibit is, is really fun. It's really engaging. Um, it's full of so much content that you would have to stick around for about four or five hours if you tried to watch every video that's actually in there. Um, it allowed us to, before COVID, bring in wonderful writers. Um, so Jalissa Arce um, and, 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 and other folks who came in, who met with group, big groups of students, students who got copies of their books, you know, um, these really engaging opportunities to um, connect the writers with people. Um, and uh, you can see a picture of a young girl there uh, 
going through some of the content. It was really fun once the exhibit was up when we had field trips coming into the building to see people um, come in and see especially young people. And I will tell the story of a young uh, Korean girl who was with a school group and in her school, she was the only Korean student. And so when she found a Korean writer um, in R.O. Kwan on one of the screens, she was enamored and was running from screen to screen to find every instance of R.O. Kwan speaking and listening to them multiple times because it wasn't something she had thought of, you know, that, you know, oh, wow, I'm Korean, she's Korean, and she's a writer. I didn't know that was possible because it wasn't something that she saw represented in her school and in the works that they were reading. And so that was the type of outcome that we would want to see from something that we were doing. Um, now, COVID hit. This exhibit went up in 2019, um, in the latter part of 2019. We were having wonderful programming and uh, we had to figure out what do we do? So as soon as COVID hit, we had plans for this content to go online. It went online within two weeks or three weeks of us shutting down. We launched my-america.org um, because this was such a video driven and a uh, digital content driven exhibit. We were able to put a bunch of the content up online. We were able to take the programs that had happened in our space that we had recorded um, on digital video and post them to YouTube. We were able to take the um, educational content materials that were developed for the exhibit for in-person visits and create them for online. Um, so it was actually the first thing that we did when we shut down is our staff redirected themselves toward figuring out how do we get this content, which is so important, out to the public and out to teachers who can no longer do things with their students. Um, how do we help them engage with this? So that site went live very quickly after COVID hit and it became um, kind of a cornerstone of our activity throughout 2020. Putting more content online, making it accessible for teachers and creating um, opportunities for online field trips and opportunities for teachers to have content that they could bring into their classroom. Um, as, as the video I showed mentioned earlier, you know, we, <clears throat> we took our timeline, American Voices, and have made an exhibit out of that. Um, we launched a Ray Bradbury exhibit, a digital exhibit first, and when we reopened in May of this year, we have a small physical exhibit on Ray Bradbury. Um, and again, my apologies, um, this is one of those things where you go, wow, it's hard to believe that this is also in Indiana. Um, but most of the material comes from the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, um, IUPUI. Um, there's a professor there who was raised, one of Ray's biographers and um, a close friend of his. And the family gave him all of the content of Ray's basement uh, office when he died. Um, and Ray was a pack rat. So it is a treasure trove of information and material on Ray Bradbury. Um, we immediately put up After My America, we took our Frederick Douglass exhibit and took the content of that and turned it into an interactive online exhibit. Um, so, you know, these are some of the things that we've been doing um, to engage the world. Uh, our Frederick Douglass exhibit, as I mentioned, one of the things that happened, uh, in, obviously, in 2020 with George Floyd was institutions needed to figure out how do I respond to something like this. Again, we did not, as a staff, feel that we had the, the right to respond in any way, um, that we were representative enough of as a staff um, to respond on our own. Um, but because we had done an exhibit in 2018 on Frederick Douglass, um, because we had had so many writers come through to talk about Douglass or to promote um, other works that we thought were tied to Douglass after 2018, when we had launched the exhibit, um, we reached out to those writers and those people, and we asked them to join us in a reading of the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. So we did a four hour live online reading um, with different authors reading chapters of the book um, as our way of responding to what had occurred. We had actually, right before George Floyd launched the online content of Frederick Douglass, um, not knowing what was going to happen, and then we, we responded as best we knew how, which goes back to the notion of many voices. Um, we turned to those people who we thought would be most um, significant in 
talking um, and reading this work and connecting the past and the present, which it, the un what thing that continued to come up when we talked about Douglas was unfortunate relevance. When we did the initial exhibit, we had young people reading passages of Douglas in a multimedia piece because we thought it was important for people to realize just how salient his words still are. This was in 2018. And so we asked students from the group Young Chicago Authors to come and we recorded them and we made them a part of the exhibit. Um, so this was, you know, again, an, an, an instance of that. And so growing out of some of this work, um, I, I'm going to mention really quickly a, a side note, which has nothing to do with Frederick Douglass and then what we did there. But another online exhibit that came out of the work that we have done came from an author named Hisaya Yamamoto. If you're not familiar with her, that's because she's not part of the canon as we would think of her, though she is an incredibly important Japanese American writer. Um, her short stories are on par with Hemingway. She is incredibly well respected um, and uh, was published in her day um, in the Paris Review um, alongside people um, of all great note and was extremely important, but her work was limited to a number of short stories, um, and there was an anthology collection in the 80s of all of her work. Um, what's fascinating about her is her time as a writer is that she was a young woman um, taken off to the camps um, in California. Um, she was a writer in the camps. She uh, actually wrote for um, the newspaper that was the daily newspaper that was published in her camp, um, wrote a murder mystery about being on the train um, that was serialized in that newspaper, um, had just, you know, some amazing work and, um, and, and an amazing and interesting life. And so she became a reporter after uh, the, um, her time in the camps when she went back to, San, or back to California, um, to Southern California, and, um, and actually wrote for an African-American newspaper um, in the 40s um, and wrote about what was happening to African-Americans around the country after having coming out of the camps um, where she had lived for three years. So um, again, fascinating person. We were asked um, by Google to put together an online exhibit about her. Um, and uh, so we created an online exhibit about her in ties with Asian American History Month. But again, we never do this by ourselves. So we reached out to one of the foremost scholars of her work and then were connected actually with her daughter. And so what we were able to put together was something that was a really interesting look at her work and its significance. Um, and those are the types of things that we try to do. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we have a new exhibit coming up and it was an exhibit um, that was conceptualized last year, obviously, and it tied back to that notion of the unfortunate relevance, the, the continuation of people like Douglas's works that continue to be horribly relevant today. Um, a great example of that is uh, Richard Wright's novel that was just published. If you didn't hear about it, the Amer uh, Library of America Publishing House um, recently released the novel of Richard Wright's that was never published, that was about police violence. Um, in African-American communities, um, and the Library of America was, um, at the time that it was written, no publisher would publish it. It was too controversial. Um, it is unfortunately all too real and um, too much uh, tied to the modern day, and the Library of America actually just published it. So um, there is a new Richard Wright novel that came out a few months back, um, and, and I would encourage everybody to, to read it. Um, so that actually led us to this notion of all of the writing from the end of the Civil War through the Civil Rights era that have these amazing impacts on who we are. Um, so we went back to our good friend, Kedrick Roy, who is a bit of an icon now, um, the Ford Fellow. Um, he, this is the chap at Harvard who helped us out with our Douglas exhibit and is now our content leader on our project um, called Dark Testament. So this is a content uh, project that will start in 2022. Um, we'll run throughout 2022. There will be online content. There will be a big multimedia and physical exhibit that will take up multiple spaces within our museum and it will run for well over a year. Um, so we're excited about the initiative. 
Kedrick has been working with a team of black scholars um, and writers to help put together um, thoughts on, you know, why, who should be in the exhibit? What should we talk about? What are some of the themes? Um, so uh, some of these folks, uh, you might know Natalie Moore from WBEZ here in the Chicagoland area and NPR, um, Gloria Edom, who I mentioned before, Nate Marshall um, is also local to Chicago. Most of these other people are from other parts of the world. Um, Kedrick was nice enough to come into town. I mentioned uh, we had an in-person event um, and Kedrick came and spoke at that event and talked about the initiative. Dark Testament as a title, we, we are taking from uh, Polly Murray. Uh, Polly Murray was a civil rights activist, a poet, a lawyer, an Episcopal priest. Um, and uh, on October 1st, there is a new documentary about Polly Murray that is coming out. Again, this is often one of those times where there is someone who may not be a canonical voice, a voice that we may not be familiar with as American readers, as white American readers. Um, and the advisory group that we were working with, again, helped us find a title because they knew this poem. So Polly Murray wrote a poem called Dark Testament. She has a collection of poetry that's titled Dark Testament, but the poem itself is a 12 verse poem um, that is incredibly moving and incredibly detailed about the nature and history of African-Americans in American history. But Polly Murray was influential in law. She's actually a cornerstone um, to the overturning of Brown v. Board of Education. Um, and she was uh, one of the first female uh, law students at Howard University. Um, she was kicked off of a bus for not sitting down in 1940. Um, and uh, and they um, were part of the LGBTQ community, though not out um, to the world. But her diaries and other things have led to a number of discoveries about her life, along with all of her amazing work and her work with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and a whole bunch of other organizations. So um, I would encourage you all to watch that documentary when it comes out. But so this is our next major content initiative. This is um, how we go about putting something like this together, getting the right people, getting people whose voices, um, who understand the voices that need to be talked about and helping us as an institution provide a platform through which some of these stories can be told, all with the notion hearkening back to our idea that we want to be able to inspire people about the power and importance of writing through our history and our culture and our daily lives. These are just some of the folks who are gonna be featured. Um, we actually started uh, at Printers Row Lit Fest um, a couple weeks ago, we had Colson Whitehead there. Um, we had a number of other writers there that we had invited um, in sponsorship of a tent. Uh, we had them there so that we could start interviewing them for this exhibit and creating the multimedia pieces that will go into the exhibit. Um, so Wyatt Moore, Koa Beck, Haki Matabudi were a few of the folks that we interviewed uh, recently. And that is pretty much what I wanted to talk about. I hope that I have kept your interest. Um, what I wanted to talk about was this notion that you can't have a writer's museum without engaging multiple voices because American writing is broad, diverse, and deep. So thank you all. Thanks so much, Carrie. That was just really interesting. And I'm like really glad I was here today to hear it all. Um, and I look forward to figuring out when it's safe to be down there and see it. <laughs> um, so this, we have a break. We're going to have a question and uh, we're, uh, Carrie will answer questions that if you're um, in the room, there's a microphone over here. We're going to take turns and I'm a traffic cop. Don't mess with me. Uh, if you're not in this room and you have a question, you can type it in the, uh, to the right of the YouTube um, video. There's a chat function and um, someone will relay that to me. And I'll pose that question from over there. So um, if, if we're between now and the questions, we're going to have a brief interlude. Um, as ever, we rely on the um, do donations to keep our programming going. And if you are in this room, there's a basket in the back. And you can give online if you want. And if you're not in this room, you can give online. Um, the, there will be a website scrolling um, on the screen while the music plays. So I'll be back in a minute for your questions. Thank you.
when the first question goes, I am standing in front of a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm curious if you can, to me, one of the big learnings of the last year and a half, um, well, I guess I have to, sort of two, there's two big learnings. One is the, um, just the idea of what, of institutional racism and what that means about how institutions work and what has, where has leadership come up? What voices do we hear just by virtue of what, of power and how it's been distributed or not distributed? So I'm wondering if that has caused you guys to reflect on your hundred, the his, the, the static part, the historical part, and is it worth rethinking whether there's voices that uh, weren't heard as loudly as they might have been, or maybe deserve to be amplified from the dead people, um, analogous to your work with the live people. Uh, and I'll leave that one there and if maybe ask my second one later. Thanks. Sure. Um, yes, I would say that um, we've been uh, looking at and always knew that as an interactive space, um, we can change our content. Um, so it was designed somewhat to be able to be changed with the notion that a lot of thought went into some of the representation and what is in there. Um, so that hundred, say, of authors that we never say are the most important um, are does include voices that people might not know about and might not have heard of as much as well as your Hemingways and your Faulkners and people of that uh uh, nature who are the more well-known, not necessarily the best or anything to that notion. But that being said, we do have the capacity to change. Um, and we recognize that if we were to change, it would require putting together a team again, um, revisiting the content. And one of the things we've talked about is the notion that that wall in that particular exhibit, it, when we look at it as a physical piece, what's interesting is that it has a limited space, so I can't just add. Um, so if I was going to add an author, I have to take one away. So that our conversations would have to be about not only who do we want to take down from this wall, or who do we want to put up, but who do we want to take down from this wall, which I think is actually a very interesting conversation to have. Um, so I have a question from an online uh, viewer. Is there a public archive component in existence or plan for the museum for individual researchers? Um, as I mentioned, we have put a great deal of content online. So if you go to our website and go to the exhibits page now, there are you know six or more exhibit online initiatives, and they are tied. Uh, the American Voices one is tied to that timeline. Um, I wouldn't say that all of our content will wind up online. Um, we are not necessarily a research institution in that nature. Also because our content is not deep in the archives nature. As I said, we've borrowed content from other institutions and, and put them together in a way that's meant to be interactive. So I don't think we will be putting together an archive to work online, but we will continue to work with other institutions. And, and to that end, you know, if you really want what's the best repository, you know, as I mentioned the Newberry Library earlier today, the Library of Congress is an amazing online resource. Um, we actually just got a grant from them to help uh, incorporate primary resources within our educational work with our student groups. Um, so we'll be pulling from their resources. So I don't think we need to compete with people on the archive well, I got it. And this is another online question. Um, how do you manage hiring? What kinds of roles does the museum employ and which roles are hard to source? Um, we are a lean organization. So there are 12 of us. Um, and so I would say the largest component of my staff right now are people who work in um, education and programming um, and then operationally uh, running the museum floor and uh, is the other component. So um, other than that, I have a lean group of people who handle my marketing and a lean group of people in development. So that's about all of us. Um, we are not hiring right now. Um, we did have to scale down slightly um, during COVID, um, and, uh, but we hope that next year uh, things will go back on track. But our online work actually increased so much that we were able to keep most of our people and keep everyone busy. So that was my other question, just thinking back about the last year and a half and the digital pivot that you were forced to do. How has that got you to rethink what's the difference between, why do I bother to not just click through in my dining room versus go down to Michigan Avenue and walk through the room? Like, what should be, what's different about being in that physical space and how do you use my time and energy differently than clicking through? I don't know if you guys have thought a lot about that. 
Yeah, actually, we, we, we do because of the notion that when we first opened, we were such a, an interactive space. It was obvious that we had content we could put online, but the question was, well, what do we put online and diminish the notion of people visiting? What we pretty much learned is that online, you can do some really interesting stuff and you can put deeper content than we might actually have in the museum. But the interaction is then different. Um, when people are online and they may take the time to read through a more detailed passage about this particular author or really dig down into something, uh, the truth is that in the museum experience, a lot of it is the ability to jump from one topic to another by your physical location. You know, people enjoy walking through a space and engaging with it. And that's not the same as sitting on a screen or looking at your computer. So the resources we put online are really good for people and people enjoy them um, for that type of activity, but people want to get out. And since we've reopened, we've seen a lot of people who are willing to come down and wear a mask and wash their hands and use styluses for the touch screens. And I, I think that there is a very different feeling and it's also broader. Each of the online exhibits are on a focused area whereas the um, content of the museum is broad and gives people a lot more interaction. So um, uh, you focused on the fact that this is a national enterprise and meant to be American. If somebody with deep pockets in Chicago came with a big donation, could they get the Chicago Annex? Would you do sort of a drill down special version for Chicago or is it important that remain perceived to be national? Um, well, they're, they're, one of the spaces in our museum is called the Wintrust Chicago Gallery. So while it is a national museum in its scope, we did set up a, a, a small engaging area that is just about Chicago writers. Um, so, uh, and, and Wintrust was the sponsor of that. So I will say their name twice um, because they've been very supportive <laughs> of us um, and they're a wonderful institution. Uh, but, um, they, uh, but that uh, is a place that, you know, people do come and engage because we are a national museum, so the bulk of our content is about the national story, but they picked Chicago for a reason. It has a strong literary tradition, and we wanted to highlight some of those writers and, and some of what ties them together. So I have another question from online, and I want to remind those in the room that you're welcome to come over and stand at this microphone if you have a sensible question. If it's not sensible, I will stare sternly. Um, you talk, This is from online. You talked of all sorts of writing uh, being represented, parentheses, literature, science, songwriting, and parentheses. Does that include things like video game writers or others who are often overlooked? Um, currently still overlooked, but in deep discussion. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, talked about programming uh, that can feature some of that topic, and we've been trying to put together a couple of programs on it. We pulled together a group of experts to really talk about our educational work um, in the last uh, year and a half during COVID, um, who were giving us ideas about expanding our educational work. And we talked to them about the idea of video game writing and all that goes into it um, and writing online for things like YouTube and, and, and all types of different channels. And we actually had an expert uh, from the University of Chicago on uh, video gaming and, and game design and its interaction with literature and writing. Um, and so we do intend to explore that and find ways to feature it through programming and eventually potentially through special exhibits. I have a, a comment and a question. I hope this is a sensible one. <laughs> okay. uh, I had um, I was very impressed in terms of the amount of content that you have at the museum in such a relatively small space for such a you know such a scope a natural uh, a national scope. I volunteer at a, a cultural museum and we have a very limited space as well. So I'm very impressed with the fact that you have so much content in, in that uh, space. And my question had to do with, I, um, I'm a member and I have been attending pre-COVID days, uh, a number of the, the talks given mm -hmm. there. And I find them so relevant and so important. Uh, I'm just wondering whether or not um, the museum finds it a challenge to reach out to a more diverse audience. Um, do you mean when you say reach out to a more diverse audience in those who will attend the programs or in the writers that we bring into the room? Uh, oh, no, not at all. Not the writers. Uh, obviously, you know, your programming is very inclusive, mm -hmm. which I think is great. Um, I, I kind of was noticing 
uh, at the, the, at the, the events, yeah. yeah, which is limited because, you know, you can only have a certain number of people and then, you know, you're located downtown. But just yeah, wait. we, um, uh, that is a, a, a big issue um, we've talked about is how do we bring people down who might not come downtown for a program that is, say, from a writer where we would want a more diverse audience. Um, and, yeah, we, we, as you may have seen in some of the pictures, that sometimes happens through the students that we bring into the building and having dual programs where an author comes into town and talks to a group of students during the day and a different group um, during the night. Uh, uh, there's a picture in there of Denez Smith, and I um, uh, distinctly remember their conversation um, and having a lot of fun with the student group that was brought in and the evening group being very less diverse um, and a very different audience. And it was fine. It was just it was something that they noticed. And um, and it is one of those things where we have to, as much as possible, better market what our programs are. Um, to broader audiences and hope that um, they want to come and hear from those writers. Um, I stepped outside when I heard you mention LGBT. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a question. Have you ever considered doing an exclusively LGBT writers um, exhibit? I mean, I know there are many dead LGBTQ writers who would, uh, would rec and, and Gay Pride is coming up. They're going to hold it on October mm -hmm. the 8th. Yeah, so. um, we have done programs obviously with living authors. Um, there are writers who are featured in the museum who are LGBTQ. And we have discussed the notion of whether or not an exhibit similar to My America or the upcoming Dark Testament might be one focused in LGBTQ issues. Obviously it was a, a strong topic of the Dark Testament uh, program that we're putting together in the sense of making sure that there's representation across spectrums of people um, within the community. And um, so it's always something that we talk about. I don't necessarily wanna say that we've been the best at it to date um, and we want to do more. And so it will be and has been a point of discussion um, to make sure that we have as much representation. And, and there was a really interesting exhibit um, that I looked at trying to bring to Chicago um, there was a museum in, in DC called the Museum, um, and a wonderful museum that unfortunately did not make it physically. They still exist as an institution, but they lost their giant gorgeous space in Washington, DC. And um, one of their last um, uh, exhibits was on uh, Stonewall, and, um, and it was, was actually kind of a history of LGBTQ writing. Um, there were some really interesting artifact pieces in it and some wonderful uh, components to it. And I had walked through it probably a few months before they closed. Um, and I did talk to them. It is something that is transferable. My physical space probably can't hold it. Um, and, uh, but I would like to find a way to get it to Chicago, maybe in partnership with another organization. Um, because it was a really amazing exhibit. So we, we will look at how best we can do that. Um, sure. Hi. Hi. Um, you said uh, you can talk a lot about the educational outreach from the museum, and I'm just mm -hmm. wondering how, if you can tell us how much or how generally uh, writers and writing for children and young adults is part of the museum's work or... Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's actually usually a pretty big part, um, as you saw in that uh, some of those photos of authors, you know, those were uh, primarily people who've written young adult books um, that we brought in, a Cuban-American author from Florida who's phenomenal and does programming for people all the time in classrooms. Uh, Julissa Erce travels around the country and does school group talks about her book, um, which she originally wrote a biography about her story specifically and then uh, wrote a young adult version of that. Um, so uh, we love bringing in young adults. We actually have an online program. If, you, if you're interested in the educational components of what we do, um, you know, there's an education section. Um, and one of the things we've been doing is working with uh, some young adult writers uh, who we connect directly with classrooms live online. Um, we have pre-recorded pieces from them and then they're available for a Q&A with the students. Um, so we have a, a group of writers that we're working with, you know, from a picture book author to, you know, um, more middle grades and a little bit higher. Um, so we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. So when I think of American writers, I think of thousands and I'm um, just uh, 
just would you review how many people are, are involved in your team in uh, uh, sifting through all this and deciding? Um, and could you review a little bit of the, of the process of how you do that? That's question number one. Question number two is, do you have uh, live volunteers for live events? Is, is anyone uh, uh, able to volunteer to help you uh, with the physical nuts and bolts kind of things? Um, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. Um, we have had volunteers primarily usually around programming. Uh, as the museum is more or less self-guided um, for people and interactive, we don't usually have docents um, and, and volunteers to move people around. We encourage people to walk around and engage with the content. But when we do have programs, we've had groups of volunteers who've helped us out, you know, because if we have 150 people in the museum um, and we have folks coming through and author lines afterwards for book signings, we do often need help for that. And we've actually had helpers who have come in to help us with field trips. Um, so all of that has been on hiatus. Um, because we have not been having physical field trips, nor have we been having author programs going on. But um, as things start to open up and we start to do more, um, we will do that again. So if you're interested, you can reach out to the museum online and um, someone would get in touch with you and we would let you know what was going on. Uh, number two to your bigger question was, you know, as a, there were about 50 people involved in the initial conceptualization of the museum and the content that is in it. Um, so that content um, is now under, you know, kind of it's there. And so if we went back and revisited, as we were talking about in the other question, um, we would have to put together a team. So we'd kind of turn to some of those original content leaders and then we would bring in a group of subject matter experts to revisit physical content. Um, and then we normally bring in people that vary on the size of the program. So if we're doing a, a, an exhibit like the Dark Testament one that we're working on right now, you know, there's seven or so people involved um, in helping us figure that out. Same thing for My America. If it's something smaller or a smaller exhibit more focused, it might only be a couple of people. Um, but you know, those are the folks that are content are normally people we're bringing in to help us put it together. Yeah, um, kind of going back to that idea of like selection in the canon um, mm -hmm. with the timeline and the books. Who are some of the least controversial people on that sort of <laughs> list? Like the ones who are like, oh yeah, of course, like that person's gonna, and they're still there. Um, you know, I mean, easily less controversial. You know, obviously a Frederick Douglass is not controversial um, and a, uh, um, you know, somebody that people expect to see, you know, Hemingway is there, Faulkner is there. Yeah. Um, Kate Chopin is there. Um, I'm just I'm running through. It's it's you know a litany of folks. Um, uh, I mean, I don't really think any of them are controversial for being there. Um, I think that you know you expect your um, Emily Dickinsons and and other folks are of course there. Uh, but you know, is there somebody missing? Um, from that timeline that somebody would be like, why isn't this person there? I'll, I'll give you an example because I hear this one in, in case she is watching this online, I'll be in trouble. But I have a board member who is asked all the time why Studs Terkel is not in that timeline. Now, Studs is featured over in our Chicago gallery. I think Studs Terkel is a very important author and, and, a, and a great writer. Um, but he didn't make the cut in that particular exhibit. But again, we'd normally say that that isn't about being a cut. Um, that timeline is one piece. Across from it, the Surprise Bookshelf has a hundred different writers. Um, so, you know, all told, when you go through the museum, there's over 350 writers who may get a small mention here or a mention there, but they are featured. So, cool. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think this might be our last question. It's from online, mm -hmm. um, and it's a light note to end on. Okay. <laughs> you said there are disagreements on content. Time to fess up. Who is your favorite musical writer you haven't been able to get folks to put on display? Um, well, I, I can tell you that I cheated um, because in my America, um, our songwriter is uh, uh, Louis Perez of Los Lobos um, because I like Los Lobos and Louis Perez has written all of their songs and he was nice enough to connect with us at one point and I leaned on him heavily to be in the exhibit. So I did cheat there um, and get one of my favorite songwriters ever featured in the museum. Um, so, so I would end on, I cheated and they're there. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. 
Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, and when I'm not scared of being in a room of bigger than this full of people, I'm going to go down there. Thanks. You can steal your computer back.